Let's have a word of prayer. Let's go to our Father's throne, if you'll play with me, please. Our wonderful and, old, and holy and awesome Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight and wanting to express our praise and adoration to you for the amazing God that you are, for creating us and sustaining us through this day, for giving us the blessings that we need, both physically and spiritually. We thank you so much for each one of us who are able to be here tonight, for those who are taking the time to fall in with these lessons and studying online as well later on. We're thankful for the chance that we have to be connected in whatever way, to uh, learn more about you, to learn and to consider and think about the ways we can share the gospel with other people. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us in our time together this evening as we think about the opportunities we have to teach the gospel with others and uh, teaching the truths of your word. Help us to be humble as we are always looking to grow and to have better understanding and better reasoning and uh, a firmer uh, sure foundation upon the truths of your word that we see as we learn and continue to grow in them. Help us to uh, continue to think about and pray for boldness with others that we come in contact with our life who are still learning the truth of the gospel and have questions. Help us to be patient and kind with them, to listen to them, and give us wisdom and grace as we look to speak truth with them and to share the gospel with them as well. We pray for those that we have been mentioning and thinking about, and uh, especially in this class, those that we know of who are close to us, who have not yet opened their hearts to the gospel. For those that we know who have wandered away from the faith, we continue to keep them on our minds and hearts as a church family and continue to pray for their restoration and for their coming back to you. And Father, as we spend time in your word tonight, help us to be good students of your word and thinking about the ways that we are still learning and growing as we look for opportunities to share and to to teach others about the amazing God that we serve and the things we get to do as a church family working together and the blessings we have to worshiping you. And Father, help us to, to always find joy through the, the promises that you give us and through the teaching of your word. It's in Jesus' name that we humbly pray. Amen. Well, if you're there on page 7, uh, on letter C, we're speaking about the Lord's Supper have your Bibles close by. Uh, if you need to find some of these passages, you can turn to them. I don't have a specific passage in mind right now, but I'm sure at some point during Bible class, we will use our Bibles at some point. That would be a good thing for us to do in our Bible class on Wednesday night. We'll at least be referencing them some of our passages. So if you follow along with me, again, the big thought here is that I want to worship God in a manner that is pleasing to Him. When it comes to the things that we do in our worship, the things that we do as we work together as a church family, God decides those things because He is the one receiving that worship. He is the one who is the Creator and has given us all things. He is the one who has authority through His Word. That's kind of somewhat paralleling some things we're talking about in our Sunday morning class right now as well. And so we want to be honoring and pleasing to Him, so we want to look in His Word to see what is it that we need to do to please Him in our worship. So that comes to the Lord's Supper, letter C. Point number one says that Christians assemble together on the first day of the week to remember Jesus' death. They do other things like pray and sing, like we've talked about already, but that is one of the things that we do as we come together, particularly on the first day of the week. There, number two, you can read out the blanks as I speak them in just a moment. On the night before Jesus died, he instituted a memorial to his sacrificed body and shed blood. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Matthew 26, 26. goes on on the next page, page 8 and number 3. Continue to think about the Lord's Supper. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26, 27, and 28. I've got some things that I've got in my mind to come back to when we open up for a little bit of discussion in just a second, but let's continue to move on for the time being. Uh, point number four there. Paul's letter to the church in Corinth shows us that the local church is assembled to partake of this memorial together. For I received from the Lord that which, was delivered, that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You got a little cheat code, and that's right here for you tonight. Uh, he goes on and says, In the same way he took the cup, also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant. Oh, I gave that one away. In my blood, 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. Finally, thinking about the Lord's Supper, we see Jesus' institution of the Lord's Supper. We see the relevance of, basically, you know, you look at points one and points two, and then points four is basically literally just the same. It's directly quoting the things that we just talked about. The reason we have that point there on point number four is the fact that we see Christians doing that. Paul is writing to people, this is after Jesus has gone back into heaven, and you're seeing people are doing this. This is not something that Jesus did one time, and that was just for a moment, but Christians continue to remember Jesus' death. That's why we have that passage right after the moment that Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. Finally, point number five, the scripture indicates that Christians meant to do this on Sunday. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. To honor this pattern, we partake of this memorial of Jesus Christ on Sunday every week. There might be some people who have taken communion or taken Lord's Supper before, but they maybe have different amounts of times or frequencies that they've partaken of that. The point here is that we're not just emphasizing the first day of the week, but we're also emphasizing why we're taking the Lord's Supper. Because Jesus commanded it, he's commanded to be memorial for what he's done for you and for me. That time is not just a I eat a little bread, I throw back a little juice, I've checked the box. That's something that very much needs to involve this and thinking about our relation to each other too and thinking about our relation to Jesus and what's going on in that moment. This and this need to be engaged more than just our mouth and our tummy as we're partaking of the Lord's Supper. And that's kind of what we're learning from this section. We'll come back to more communion or more Lord's Supper stuff if we need to in just a second. But let's move on to letter D. Letter D is talking about giving. God has very important work for the church to accomplish. We are to support needy saints, spread the gospel into the world, provide a place for worship. In order to do this, God establishes weekly contributions by the saints to meet these needs. A couple passages with this. Point number two. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also on the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collections may be made when I come. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. There's a pattern there that we're seeing in the New Testament that we continue to follow and to, to fulfill today. Point number three, please note that tithing, or a mandatory 10%, is not a part of the New, New Testament pattern, but giving as he may prosper, and more importantly, that, he must, that we must give from the heart. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7 each one must do as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly nor under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We we'll wrap up this section, point number four there. There is no record in the New Testament of churches. And if you, if you have a writing utensil, I would encourage you to underline that part of this sentence there. Of churches raising funds by soliciting from the world, business ventures, or in any other way. It is just amazing Christian givers in Jesus' name. So we talk about what's going on with things related to church treasury, and we're going to talk more about that in just a second in this lesson. That point is emphasizing the fact that when it comes to how a church raises the funds for what it does, churches, as we look at them in the New Testament, do that from what saints do as they provide and as they give cheerfully as they purpose in their hearts. I said we'll come back and hit other things we might need to talk about, but let's get through, uh, that's the wrong way to phrase that, let's get to Letter E as well, and thinking about teaching. Point number one there, God's people love to learn more about the Word. We take to heart the words of Jesus. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Matthew 5 and verse 6. In fact, we understand that on the judgment day, it is the Word of God that will be our judge. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has the one who judges him, the word I spoke is what will judge him on that last day. John 12, 48. Just to pause here for a second, you know, hopefully anybody who believes in Jesus is going to say they want to know more about Jesus. They want to know more about what's in the Bible. There are probably some people who think that, you know, I, whatever I have in my own convictions and feelings or whatever I feel is God speaking to me is worth more than what is in the Bible itself. But I think people are going to see there's value of opening God's word and reading what God's word has to say. 
But there is also the point to be made that this is not just a, um, it's not just a self-help book. This is not like a recipe book or a phone number or our prayer, you know, our genie wisher or things like that, our magic lamp that we rub every once in a while to you know, openly, magically find our passage for the day to guide us. This is God's word to us, his mind to us that he wants us to know. And this is going to be how he judges us on the judgment day. Not how I expect to be judged, but he tells us, Jesus tells us that it is through his word that is going to be which we are judged one day. So that's why we need to pay serious attention. That's why we spend some time in our Bible classes and in our sermons, making sure that they're not just pick-me-ups, but there are things that are helping us to learn God's Word. And if that's ever out of priority, that's a dangerous place for a church to be. So we also make sure that we're focused on emphasizing the teaching of God's Word. Point number two under letter E on page eight. Point number two under letter E. We put great emphasis on studying the Bible and worship. Like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. Letter th- or number three, our Bible classes and sermons will be centered on the Scripture. We will read it, consider it, and seek to learn it and live it. All Scripture is inspired by God and proper for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. So these things that we do as we come together... These are not just things that we do as a group. There are also things that we can do as individuals. We talked about that with praying and singing. That's not just a, okay, it's 1034, and so Tracy's finally finished the announcements, and so Clint's going to finally get up and lead us some songs, so now is the singing time for the next 10 minutes. No, that's something that we do as we're here at worship. That's something we can do on our own and should do on our own, just as well as prayer, just as well as spending time with the Word, and even uh, maybe not the Lord's Supper, I'll uh, concede to that. But we get the idea or the understanding. These are things we do to worship God because they're founded upon the teaching of His Word. Uh, Before I throw it to you all, under these last three sections of either questions or comments or things, on related to the Lord's Supper or giving or teaching, if you would go back to letter C, number three. Uh, Letter C, number three, on the top of page eight. This is talking about the cup. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for a reason. And there's something for me, and maybe you've made this connection before, too, uh, as we've mentioned many times, that studying the Bible with somebody is not just about getting them underwater and getting them out of water. But I think there is maybe an important point to be made about the fact that Jesus' blood has been poured out for the forgiveness of sins as relation to maybe a passage we know in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, where we need, to be, we need to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. Let me when I talk about Greek words there, maybe you've heard some of those conversations, discussions, you know, that four is, is a, like, I've already repented, I've already been saved, so I'm being baptized because I'm saved. I don't think that this, and I don't know a whole lot more about Greek than I like to say that I think they put cucumbers in their food and they eat yogurt a lot. That's about all I know about Greek. Uh, but here you look at this, Jesus has shed his blood for the forgiveness of the sins. I don't think that's because people are already saved. I think there would be a connection. If that point is a helpful point for you to have in your back pocket, then maybe consider that thinking about a connection between the language and wording and what's going on in Matthew 26, 27, and 28, and some similar language that I think is appropriately connected in Acts 2.38. But I'll be be quiet for a second. What things might be helpful for us to think about, other things to have on the left side of our page related to Things we're going to hear from people that we need to maybe consider to think about and ponder and try to have questions or answers for already or things that have been helpful for you when discussing the Lord's Supper or the giving of the saints. We'll talk more about what we do with that in just a moment. So if it's that kind of stuff, we'll get to work-related things in just a second, Works of the work of the church, or things related to teaching as well. Comments, questions, additional help. No, no, she says. Aaron, anything, anything you've learned in Florida that can help us 
He hasn't learned anything in Florida, I think is what he just said. Now, I'm sure he's learned lots of good things there. Glenn, anything that can help us about Lord's Supper stuff or giving or teaching, things that we can know as we're talking with other people? So there's, because uh, I've never been to a wedding where they've done that, so I've never thought about that question before. But there's something of, you know, is it purely restricted to a particular day, particularly the first day? Is that like that person's question? Yeah. How would you answer that? Yeah, that would, that would take some things for me personally to think about and to, to dig in more of, and I don't know if I really want to open this up for the last 20 minutes of class, but maybe when they think of, you know, if people are remembering the Lord's death, you know, I think it's appropriate to remember the Lord's death at any time. It's not just on a Sunday morning, you know, on a, any day of the week you think about Jesus dying for you, that's a, probably a good thing for us to remember at any moment. Maybe what do we do about something like that? Though? That's a good question for us to maybe have in mind and think about it. And you, you might do what I just did and say, well, I don't know. I'll have to think more about that. Well, more about that. For me, I was at that wedding. Mm-hmm. And they passed around a loaf of bread. And then, so that's what they were doing. And I just, so a lot of times I'll try to, you know, just bow my head or something like that just to be not, not where I didn't stick out like a sore thumb. Sure, right. There you go. Good. Anything else we can think about? Lord's Supper? Bo, anything about Lord's Supper or giving or teaching? Uh, There's questions about when do we partake of it? Those are, again, that's an issue I know that I have not done much personal study on, and I don't really know positions about something like that. That might be something of, you know, we, we could value from thinking about that and maybe trying to understand what people are coming from from that position and then trying to land on that on our own and having an understanding of that. But there, people have different thoughts about when you can take the Lord's Supper or how often you need to take the Lord's Supper, things like that, that we'll need to do study on our own for, that I'm going to ask would be post 8.05 tonight for our conversation and stuff this evening. Anything else? Anything else on teaching or giving? Uh, I might add with this on number three of letter D under giving on page eight. Please note that tithing, a mandatory 10%, is not a part of the New Testament pattern. Have you ever talked with somebody um, or been to a, a church or you visit another denomination or part of another denomination, heard a story from a preacher who said that uh, went to, I think it was either a wedding or a funeral somewhere, a denomination's church building. And on, I think it was in the foyer, so in the entrance of the building, there, on the big letters on the wall was, bring the whole tithe. Now, I think that, was, that that's somewhere from the Old Testament, but the idea is that, you know, bring your tithe with you. And sometimes you'll hear people still use that language, I'm going to give my tithe. Something I might do, uh, if people have questions about, you know, is it a tithe, is it not a tithe, what I might reference back to lesson number one again uh, I just have on my notes on this particular lesson, see lesson one, number four, letter E. So on page two, it starts talking about how I will honor Christ and his word above any other influence in my life. And then on page three, letter E under that main heading talks about the law of Moses. And where does the law of Moses play into his terms of authority in the lives of Christians? Now, just because we may not call it a tithe and we're not required to give a mandatory 10% doesn't negate what the New Testament teaches about giving and being cheerful and from our heart and as someone purposes in their heart, but that is not something that we can equate to the Old Testament. That might be something that we might need to have in our back pocket as well. Ms. Jerry? And... For a while, we were doing stuff like that. That might be going a different direction than what Glenn was raising his hand for, but I mean, over the past two or three years, probably seeing a little bit of people sending in stuff and things going on. Glenn, other thoughts about co- collection? Or? Most of the people don't even know tithing means 10%. They're, they are thinking about it being given. So. That's right. It might just be a terminology thing. It might be 
We haven't gotten to pastor stuff yet. We'll get to pastor stuff in just a second. You know, someone asked me, are you a pastor? I'm not going to go through probably a whole 15-minute gymnast, gymnastics of, well, I don't call myself a pastor. I'll probably continue to refer to myself as a preacher, as how I feel comfortable describing myself. But if someone calls me Pastor Jeff, I did a wedding for a friend from college one time, and he asked me, do you want to be Pastor Jeff? And I said, just put Jeff. Please don't, please don't put Pastor Jeff. I, I would like to not have paperwork somewhere with that attached to my name when I'm only 28 years old. But there might be just some terminology. That's something you can just understand, and you can think, do I got to go into a whole spiel about the Old Testament right now? If someone talks about a tithe, probably not. That'd be something that you can continue to work on bit by bit. Bear? I have um, some thoughts on the tithing. Um, I've run into it a lot, actually, that I think a lot of people do think it's you know, the 10% and they get that. And so much so that I've heard from at least six different sources, different people that wouldn't have known each other. Mm-hmm. There's a saying, do you tithe on the gross or the net, right? I'm trying not to go that, but so many people are mindful of, you know, our government gets a big chunk, you know, out of our, out of what we make, and so do we do our 10% off the pre-tax or post-tax. Mm-hmm. Pre-retirement, post I mean, there's all the ways to think about that and do that, but I, I would, my guess would be that most people give between zero and 10%. I doubt people give 11 plus other than we give 10 percent data you know every week and then something comes up brother so-and-so needs something sister so-and-so needs something these brethren need something they'll do that also right but i just think we should be careful on that because you know that's what got expected at the time right Mm -hmm. and what's changed that much other than you know you could argue maybe that a little bit that was their government sort of as well yeah um but also abraham gave 10 percent to melchizedek pre-law you know all that goes back to think about all that, that kind of stuff make a personal decision on am i giving carefully right i'm giving less and that uh some of what bear is talking about so maybe making the point of we're not commanded a 10 percent. there's nothing wrong with the 10 percent. there's something we need to consider and think about of are we just you know the trace coming in is a surprise to us, even though we're 75 years old and we've been doing this every Sunday for the past 40 years. It's like, oh, I got to, you know, I, I happen to have five bucks on me. You know, that last minute thought, or is it something that we've, we've thought about before? Is that, is that the point you're making? I'm make sure I understand some of that. Yeah, and, and when we're thinking about it and making a decision for our family or as we leave our family, you know. Where does that come from? Yeah. Where well, does that come from? Just like, well, this is a lot of money, so this, this hurts to get rid of, you know, well, but does it, you know, I, mm-hmm. Absolutely. I definitely agree with that. Um, thinking about what Barrett said, you, know, you see evidence of the tithe before the law, under the law of Moses. What was the tithe for? Why did they tithe? I mean, God said so. There was an offering that they would bring in that moment. What were they, I mean, was that just God wanted a big old vault full of goodies and he was just taking... He just decided 10% sounded good to him. Why, why, why were they using What was that for often? Or what was the... For the priests and the Levites? What are the, uh, what are the priests and Levites doing? Are they going out and plowing their fields and growing their herds? They weren't, they weren't working. And so this is part of God's law to help provide for people. And not just the Levites, but also for the needy and for those who are uh, misfortunate or less fortunate is probably the better word among their people. So there's a reason for that. And even some of that, while it may not be a specific law, some of that should carry over, hopefully, as we're making those decisions as well. Not just a flippant, God says I have to give, so I'm just going to throw something in the plate. But understanding there's a reason behind that. We think about either helping other people or the work that we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I would agree with that. I think that when we see that, those things, you know, we can't be like, you're not allowed to write checks sitting in the pew. We can't start making rules where there aren't rules, but there should be principles and there are thoughts in Scripture we need to adhere to and say, I mean, 
all this is pointing to, we've thought about this, we're thinking about what this is going for, we're doing this with a thought of God has blessed me and I'm giving cheerfully of just you know, what God has given me and we're being reminded of, even as I give this, God continues to provide. And that's a lot of the tithe too. A lot of the first fruit kind of stuff of the Old Testament that isn't called for us. Things that, you know, I have to give up first part of my crops. Well, am I going to have more crops? God gives assurances for those things. People who are faithful to the law under that particular covenant. Um, talking a lot more about giving than I expected to, but that's good. I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad to hear thoughts and have conversations about all of that. Anything else about these points? Miss Rebecca? Absolutely. That's 3 through 5, isn't that right? 3 through 5. five. Second Corinthians 8, 3 through 5 might be other things for us to think about. If you have more questions about giving, more things that we might want to talk about with someone. Uh, other things, I am going to ask that you go ahead and do, save those for the next go-around of this material, or things you can feel free to talk with one another, or talk with me after class tonight, after worship. Let's continue to move on, and let's spend our last few minutes here thinking about the second part of this lesson, the idea the local church must do the work that God has designed for it to do. When I look at this sentence, I have circles and brackets and triangles and connections and things to think. The point of what I have and what I'm looking at in this sentence is that the local church must do the work that God has designed for it to do. The local church does not get to decide, okay, what are we going to do and put God's name on it? God has decided, and the local church does that work that God has called it to do. Does that make sense? I know it's me just re-explaining the sentence, so if anything, I'm making it more complicated, potentially making it muddier. But am I emphasizing the thing that I'm looking to emphasize here, we understand in that, uh, that the local church must do the work that God has designed for it to do. So even to this point, letter A, when we're talking about local churches, Christians join together in a local in a location as a team, We strive together for the faith of the gospel, Philippians 1.27. These groups are called churches, and since they exist to honor the name of Jesus, they were sometimes called churches of Christ in Romans 16.16. What are some other church names that we see in the Bible? The church, the church of God, uh, the saints at City, the church at Thessalonica. This is sometimes, I know we, I heard some shuffles of page, go back to page eight for just a second, uh, some things we want to observe. Uh, these are sometimes called that, and this is, uh, other things we'll get into as some of our authority related lessons we'll have over the next few weeks. Uh, things to think about, uh, you know, when it comes to stuff on a sign, and I don't want to lose the last five minutes of conversations about stuff on a sign. I think, you know, Having an indication of us being a church is, is helpful, but that alone is not the end-all, be-all of things. We'll come back to seeing that with the idea of a church of Christ, like used in Romans 16, or the churches of Christ in Romans 16, 16, I appreciate the way I've heard it this way, of it's not a title, it describes the nature of that group of people. That's not a, we've got this title, we've probably heard people talk about it like that before. I'm a church of Christer, and so I do things this way. Does that rub you weird? It always rubs me weird. And it rubs me weird when it comes out of my mouth, because I've said that before. The idea that, well, because I meet with these people, this is how I do things. That's the same thing that we talk about with, and now I'll feel free to call that. Now, when we talk about our Baptist friends, we talk about our Catholic friends, we talk about our Jehovah's Witness friends, that's the same problem, the same issue when we start making, well, I'm Church of Christ, so that's why I do this. It should be, I... It, you know, the idea is sometimes we use the phrase, I'm a New Testament Christian. I'm trying to follow what God's Word has to say. 
and that I associate with the church that belongs to Jesus. And the idea of, again, it's not a title, it's a nature. The idea that it's from Christ or that it's for the glory of Christ. That's what we think about when we're talking about churches of Christ. It's churches that are from Jesus as he is the head or churches that are looking to glorify Jesus through the work and the worship that they do. With all this as well, this first section, letter A, uh, about local churches. Uh, if I say the opposite of local church, you're going to say universal church. Where does that come from? We understand that that's not, you know, local church, universal church. Those phrases specifically are not in the Bible, but they are based in the Bible. So we use terms like this, and we can concede and say, I understand that I may be using a phrase, local church. We might talk about universal church, the difference between those. Briefly, Acts chapter 2, verse 47, the Lord added to his church. That's not just Judson Road. That's not just, you know, the church that meets in Jerusalem Main Street. That's the, the body of believers who put their faith in Jesus, been added to the body, maybe like 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 through 13. Local churches are talked about in Scripture, though, of the saints at Rome or the, uh, the saints at Ephesus, the church at Ephesus in places like Romans 1, verse 7, or 1 Timothy 1 and verse 3. So those are things that maybe as we talk with people, it's helpful for us to know what we mean by that, what other people might have questions about with that. Maybe they're not familiar with universal church, local church kind of language, and we need to be prepared to try to help, help them at least understand what we mean by that. I don't want to say we need to help them understand that, because that part is not necessarily specifically Bible, but the teachings in the Bible. Does that make sense? I feel like I've had a lot of clear as mud statements and things tonight that are not reflecting well on me as a teacher. But at the same time, I feel like I am making the point. So if I'm making the point at least, then that's all right. And then we can continue to go on. We want to start at the top of page 9 and hit letter B here. The idea of local autonomy. Uh, number one, each local church is autonomous. And maybe that's a new phrase or that's a new understanding or idea. That is, each is self-governed under the headship of Jesus. And the New Testament teaches the, teach or the setting up of elderships in every church. And qualified men are placed in its rules of leadership. The leadership is to shepherd the flock of God among you. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2. Local churches are led by these men and governed by Jesus. Underline that sentence if you haven't already. Local churches are led by these men and governed by Jesus, and that there are no councils, denominational headquarters, or rules decided by men in other places. We'll have to come back to this because we're running out of time, and I do want to talk about this section. So we'll finish up lesson three. We'll move through lesson four. Uh, lesson four being you know, very much of a New Testament introduction probably doesn't have a lot of the things of additional thoughts, additional passages, additional ideas, questions to think about, things we need to think about ourselves too and ponder over as we apply these things that these first three lessons have had. We'll come back and start on page nine and uh, hit letter B and talk about local autonomy and talk about why that is a blessing that God has designed the church. Not Church of Christ Church have made it this, but God designed his church, what we read in his word, to be, you know, Jesus is the head, and that people at individual places are delegated some authority to help care for those people. Not just sit in a room and make board decisions, but to help actually care for people and think about the souls of people. That's what the work of that kind of stuff is. But I'm out of time. That's our class for this evening, and I'm going to actually go ahead and leave it there. And the bell will ring in just a second, and we'll pick up our worship in just a moment. Thank you all for being here this evening, for being part of our class tonight.